Oh, hey people, how's it going? It's Mr. Fisher here in my home studio, and I come to you tonight. Yes, it's nighttime. It's actually Sunday night. I know I'm posting this on a Monday, but uh, I already know that I just don't feel like getting up early enough to make a video before I post the assignments at 9 a.m. I'm just not that entertaining in the morning, you know? At night, I've had a full day. I had a great day. I just ate a bowl full of popcorn just now. Like literally, here's the bowl. There was some popcorn in there. So my salt levels are great. I have this mug of tea. It's green tea with antioxidants. It's doing me good. I'm enjoying it. And I thought to myself, man, I need to do some work. And uh, this isn't even really work right now. Okay, this is pleasure because this is my favorite book that I teach, Siddhartha by Her Herman Hess. And we are on chapter one. We're starting this book off. So metatextual stuff to notice. This is Herman Hesse's most famous novel. I don't know if he, his most famous novel, it says that right there. I don't know what that means, but uh, I mean, obviously I know that means that it's the most well-known and it's the only one I know. So I guess that's a good thing for him. This book was uh, $5.99. Nobody cares. Let's see. It was translated by Hilda Rossner. Now that that in and of itself isn't important. I mean, I'm sure it's important to Hilda, but the fact that it's translated by Hilda Rosner makes you question, wait, what was it translated from? Was it like translated from one of the Indian dialects or something, since this is, you know, from India, the story of Siddhartha um, or the Nepal region? And the answer is no, it was probably actually translated from German because Hermann Hesse is a German man. And so you need to think about that. I mean, this is a great book and it's a great story and there's a lot of really deep philosophical things in here, but it is another book written by a white European male. And I'm just throwing that out there, not to discredit it, not to throw any shade. I'm just pointing it out. I still love this book with all my heart. Like if I had to choose one book and say, what's your favorite book that you would take with you to a deserted island? I'd be like, what kind of weird island is this? But I guess I would take Siddhartha because it would make me think. So anyway, Siddhartha, chapter one. We're actually on part one of Siddhartha. See, Siddhartha, part one, which is also called Siddhartha. Or if you want to be um, more accurate about it, it's Siddhartha. But it's just more comfortable for me to say Siddhartha. And that's what I do. So anyway, so I'm on page number three. Chapter one, the Brahmin's son. Now you've done the essential vocabulary. So you know that Brahmin, M-I-N, this is so weird because everything's backwards. Brahmin, M-I-N, is a priest, right? And so this is a priest's son that we're talking about. Siddhartha is the son of a priest, and not just any priest. He's in the highest caste system of India, right up in the highest caste. Okay, so this dude's doing okay. He's essentially like a Forest Hills or a Bloomfield Hills or something like that. Like he's he's up there in the social elite, very well educated, lots of resources and good opportunities and obviously amazing teachers in this you know book of, for Siddhartha, Forest Hills too. But that's a whole other conversation. So this is um, chapter one and I'm going to try to read most of this chapter right now. I know you can read it on your own, but... I'm going to read it anyway. So you don't have to read it on your own if you don't want to. And plus, I have this just amazing voice that you'll probably want to listen to. So here we go. The Brahmin's son. In the shade of the house, in the sunshine on the river, riverbank, by the boats, in the shade of the sallow woods and the fig tree, Siddhartha, the handsome Brahmin's son, grew up with his friend Govinda. The sun browned his, leather sh his slender shoulders on the riverbank while bathing at the holy ablutions, at the holy sacrifices. Shadows passed across his eyes in the mango grove during play, while his mother sang during his father's teachings. When, with the learned men, Siddhartha had already long taken part in the learned men's conversations, had engaged in debate with Govinda and, and, the practice, and had practiced the art of contemplation and meditation with him. Already he knew how to pronounce Om silently. This word of words, to say it inwardly with the intake of breath, when breathing out with all his soul, his brow radiating the glow of pure spirit. Already he knew how to recognize Atman within the depth of his being, indestructible, at 
one with the universe. So I'm not going to dig too deep here because I know that you did the essential vocabulary, but we know that in this religion, in the Hindu religion, they believe that God, one of the gods, the major God, Atman, is actually inside of each person, that your soul is actually a piece of the God. And so when they meditate, they're trying to look inward and find that pure spirit within themselves in order to find calm and uh, be able to focus on themselves. And that's part of their practice. It's actually not that different from Christian prayer. If you think about it, it's quiet, it's deep contemplation, it's, it's looking inward. And, um, and it's, I mean, some people might even say that a Christian soul is a piece of God. I don't know. I'm not a theologian, but there are definitely some similarities here. So remember, when I read this, I'm not pushing any religions. I'm not dissing any religions. I'm just reading and we're just talking. Okay. So don't turn away from this video and be like, Fisher hates Buddhism. Fisher loves Buddhism. Fisher hates Hinduism. Fisher loves Hinduism. Fisher hates Christians. Fisher loves Christians. You know what? Some of those things are possibly true, but it doesn't matter because I don't talk about that. We're just focused on this book. Okay. And if you know me that well, you'd know that I pretty much love everybody, right? I don't hate people unless they're doing something to hurt me in some way. So I don't care what your religion is or your political affiliation or your skin color or any of it. I love you just the same. Hmm? Heart. Okay. That's only half a heart because I got a book in the other hand. That's, it doesn't work. I mean, whatever. Okay. So, <clears throat> Um, there was happiness in his father's heart because of his son, who was intelligent and thirsty for knowledge. He saw him growing up to be a great learned man, a priest, a prince among Brahmins. There was pride in his mother's breast when she saw him walking, sitting down and rising. Siddhartha, strong, handsome, supple-limbed, greeted her with complete grace. Now, I want to point something out here because I just said the word breast. And in this context, that means chest, okay? Okay. It doesn't literally mean her bosom, which I'm not trying to single out the guys here, but typically when the guys in my class hear the word breast, they're like, what, what, what? Well, the word breast historically has meant chest. Like a man could feel his heart swelling inside of his breast as well. He literally doesn't have bosoms, but he does have a breast. Okay. So that's what that's talking about. So calm down. It's going to be okay. All right. I don't know why I always got to do that, but that's just something you got to do. Okay. So his mom is impressed that he's beautiful and his dad loves him because he's intelligent. Okay. Love stirred in the hearts of the young Brahmin's daughters when Siddhartha walked through the streets of the town with his lofty brow, his king-like eyes, and his slim figure. So everybody else loves him because he's hot, essentially. A little materialistic, but, you know, I prefer funny. You know, a funny guy, I think, is better than an attractive guy. But uh, I'm both, so it doesn't matter to me. Um, Govinda, his friend, the Brahmin's son, loved him more than anybody else. He loved Siddhartha's eyes and clear voice. He loved the way he walked, his complete grace of movement. He loved everything that Siddhartha did and said. And above all, he loved his intellect, his fine, ardent thoughts, his strong will, his high vocation. Govinda knew that he would not become an ordinary Brahmin, a lazy sacrificial official, or an avaricious dealer in magical sayings, a conceited worthless orator, or a wicked sly priest, or just a good stupid sheep amongst the large herd. No, and he, Govinda, did not want to become any of these. Not a Brahmin like 10,000 others of their kind. He wanted to follow Siddhartha, the beloved, the magnificent, and if he ever became a god, if he ever entered the all-radiant, then Govinda wanted to follow him as his friend, his companion, his servant, his lance-bearer, his shadow. Um, this gives a whole new meaning to the term bromance. And maybe if we were reading this through a different lens, we would read deeper into that. But it sounds like Govinda just really loves him, like deep friendship deep love, not like romantic love. It doesn't say romantic love, but 
Bert, a little creepy, to be honest with you. If somebody was like, Fisher, I love you so much. I want to follow you. If you ever become a God, I want to be like your servant. I'd be concerned about that person and myself. And I'd probably change my locks because that's creepy. But anyway, we're moving on. Um, that was how everybody loved Siddhartha. He delighted and made everybody happy. But Siddhartha himself was not happy. He, um, wandering along the rosy paths of the fig garden, sitting in contemplation in the bluish shade of the grove, washing his limbs in the daily bath of atonement, offering sacrifices in the depths of the shady mango wood, with complete grace of manner, beloved by all, a joy to all, there was yet no joy in his own heart. Dreams and less restless thoughts came flowing to him from the river, from the twinkling stars at night, from the sun's melting rays. Dreams and a restlessness of the soul came to him, arising from the smoke of the sacrifices, emanating from the verses of the Rigvada, trickling through from the teachings of the old Brahmins. Siddhartha had begun to feel the seeds of discontentment within him. He had begun to feel that the love of his father and mother, and also the love of his friend Govinda, would not always make him happy, give him peace, satisfy, and suffice him. He had begun to suspect that his worthy father and his other teachers, the wise Brahmins, had already passed on to him the bulk and the best of their wisdom, that they had already poured the sum total of their knowledge into his waiting vessel, and the vessel was not full. His intellect was not satisfied. His soul was not at peace. His heart was not still. The ablutions were good, but they were water. Did they not wash sins away? They did not relieve the distressed heart. The sacrifices and supplications of the gods were excellent, but were they everything? Did the sacrifices give happiness? And what about the gods? Was it really Prajapati who had created the world? Was it not Atman, he alone, who had created it? Were not the gods' forms created like me and you, mortal, transient? Was it therefore good and right? Was it, uh, was it, not, was it sensible and worthy act to offer sacrifices to the gods? To whom else should one offer sacrifice? To whom else should one pay honor but to him, Atman, the only one? And where was Atman to be found? Where did he dwell? Where did his eternal heart beat? if not within the self, in the innermost, in the eternal, which each person carried with him. But where was this self, this innermost? It was not flesh and bone. It was not thought or consciousness. That was what the wise men taught. Where then was it? To press towards the self, towards Atman, was there another way that was worth seeking? Nobody showed the way. Nobody knew it. Neither his father, nor the teachers, or the wise men, nor the holy songs. The Brahmins and their holy books knew everything, everything. They had gone into everything. The creation of the world, the origin of speech, food, inhalation, exhalation, the arrangement of the senses, the acts of the gods. They knew a tremendous number of things. But was it worthwhile knowing all of these things if they did not know the one important thing, the only important thing? Many verses of the holy books, of all, above all, the Upanishads of Samaveda, spoke of the innermost thing. It is written, your soul is the whole world. It says that when a man is asleep, he penetrates the innermost and dwells in Atman. There was wonderful wisdom in that verse. All the knowledge of the sages was told here in enchanting language, pure as honey, collected by the bees. No, this tremendous amount of knowledge collected and preserved by successive generations of wise Brahmins could not easily be overlooked. But were, but where were the Brahmins, the priests, the wise men who had success, successful, who were successful, not only in having this most profound knowledge, but in experiencing it? Where were the initiated who attained Atman in sleep, could retain it in consciousness, in life, everywhere? in speech and in action. Siddhartha knew many, many worthy Brahmins, above all his father, holy, learned, of high esteem. His father was worthy of admiration. His manner was quiet and noble. He lived a good life. His words were wise, fine and noble thoughts dwelled within his head. But even he who knew so much did not live in bliss. Was he at peace? Was he not also a seeker, insatiable? 
But did he not go continually to the holy springs with the insatiable thirst, to the sacrifices, to the books, to the Brahmin's discourses? Why must he, the blameless one, wash away his sins and endeavors to cleanse himself anew each day? Was Atman then not within him? Was not then the source within his own heart? One must find the source within one's own self. One must possess it. Everything else was seeking, a detour, an error. All right. This first chapter is pretty heavy. Right? It's got a lot of theological, philosophical uh, contemplations. And Siddhartha, I mean, he's really laying the groundwork for his entire journey. This is a coming of age novel. He's a young man right now. We're not sure exactly how old he is. It seems like he's probably a teenager, maybe 15, 16, 17, somewhere in there. And he's starting to become discontent because much like many of you, possibly, you're starting to get old enough that you're starting to view the world differently than you did when you were younger. When you were younger, you were content to be at home, to live with your parents, to go to school. But now you're getting to the point where you feel like you've already learned everything you can from the people around you. You've learned from the teachers, you've learned from your parents, and you're ready to go out, to strike out and experience life on your own. Maybe that's college, probably most of you. Maybe that's a job, a career, but you're ready or you're close to ready. And that's where Siddhartha is right now. He feels like the love of his parents and the way life has always been is not going to be perfect forever. He must go. We all feel that pull at some point. And that's what Siddhartha is going through. Now, he's also contemplating religion. He's saying, how can I learn how to attain peace? inner peace, bliss, nirvana, however you want to say it. How can I find the oneness if I'm learning from people who haven't actually done it, right? It's like trying to learn how to read from somebody who can't read. You can give me some kind of idea maybe, but you can't teach me to read if you don't know how to read. How can you teach me to attain nirvana if you haven't done it, is what he's saying to all the learned men. And he's not wrong. And none of, I mean, none of us can teach anybody how to live their life. We can give as much knowledge as we can. We can give as much information and try to prepare you as much as we can, but we cannot completely satisfy that intellectual thirst. You're going to have to strike out in the world at some point. You're going to have to experience things for yourself and you're going to have to gain that wisdom on your own because wisdom is hard won. Have you ever heard the expression? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There's a lot of mistakes that we make. We're going to go through a lot of stuff in life. We're going to make a lot of mistakes and that's okay. It's okay to fail. It's okay to fall. It's okay to mess up. As long as you learn something. That's how you gain wisdom. You learn more from failure than you do from success. All right. So I'm actually going to, I think I'm going to read the rest of this chapter. So I'll stop pontificating here and I'll read a little bit more. These were Siddhartha's thoughts. This was his thirst, his sorrow. He often repeated to himself the words from one of the Shandoyaga Upanishads. In truth, the name of Brahman is Satya. Indeed, he who knows it enters the heavenly world each day. It often seems near the heavenly world, but never has it, never had he quite reached it. Never had he quenched that final thirst. And among the wise men that he knew, whose teachings he enjoyed, there was not one who had entirely reached it, the heavenly world, not one who had completely quenched the eternal thirst. Govinda, said Siddhartha to his friend Govinda, Govinda, come with me to the banyan tree. We will practice meditation. They went to the banyan tree and sat down 20 feet apart, 20 paces apart. Um, as he sat down, ready to pronounce the Om, Siddhartha softly recited the verse. Om is the bow, the arrow is the soul, Brahman is the arrow's goal, at which one aims unflinchingly. So this is like a mantra. It's a literal mantra that they say to try to relax themselves and focus their thinking. Um, when the customary time for the practice of meditation had passed, Govinda rose. It was now evening. It was time to perform the evening ablutions. He called Siddhartha by his name. He did not reply. Siddhartha sat, absorbed. And his eyes staring as if 
directed at a distant goal, the tip of his tongue showing a little between his teeth. He did not seem to be breathing. He sat thus, lost in meditation, thinking Om, his soul, as the arrow directed at Brahma. Some Samanas once passed through Siddhartha's town, wandering ascetics. They were three thin, worn-out men, neither old nor young, with dusty and bleeding shoulders, practically naked, scorched by the sun, solitary, strange, and hostile, lean jackals in the world of men. Around them hovered the atmosphere of still passion, of devastating service, of unpitying self-denial. In the evening after the hour of contemplation, Siddhartha said to Kavinda, Tomorrow morning, my friend, Siddhartha is going to join the Samanas. He's going to become a Samana. Govinda blanched as he had heard these words and read the decision in his friend's determined face. Undeviating as the released arrow from the bowl, bow, Govinda realized for the first glance at his friend's face that now it was beginning. Siddhartha was going his own way. His destiny was beginning to unfold itself. And with his destiny, his own. And he became as pale as a dried banana skin. Oh, Siddhartha, he cried, will your father permit it? Siddhartha looked at him like one who had just awakened. As quick as lightning, he read Govinda's soul, read the anxiety and resignation. We will not waste words, Govinda, he said softly. Tomorrow at daybreak, I will begin the life of the Samana. Let us not discuss it again. Siddhartha went into his room where his father was sitting on a mat made of ba bast. He went up behind his father and remained standing there until his father felt his presence. Is that you, Siddhartha? said Bra the Brahmin asked. Then speak. What is on your mind? Siddhartha said, With your permission, father, I have, be I have come to tell you that I wish to leave your house tomorrow and join the ascetics. I wish to become a Samana. I trust my father will not object. The Brahmin was silent so long that the stars passed across the small window and changed their design before the silence in the room was finally broken. His son stood silent and motionless with his arms folded. The father sat silent and motionless on the mat, and the stars passed across the sky. Then his father said, It is not seemly for Brahmins to utter forceful or angry words, but there is displeasure in my heart. I should not like to hear you make this request a second time. The Brahmin rose slowly. Siddhartha remained silent with folded arms. Why are you waiting? asked his father. You know why, said Siddhartha. His father left the room, displeased, and lay down on his bed. As an hour passed by and he could not sleep, the Brahmin rose, wandered up and down, and then left the house. He looked through the small window of the room and saw Siddhartha standing there with his arms folded, unmoving. He could see his pale robe sh shimmering, his heart trembling. His father returned to his bed. As another hour passed and the Brahmin could not sleep, he rose again, walked up and down, left the house, and saw the moon had risen. He looked through the window. Siddhartha stood there, unmoving, his arms folded. The moon shone on his, on his bare shin bones. His heart troubled. The father went to bed. He returned again after an hour and again after two hours. Looking through the window, he saw Siddhartha standing there in the moonlight, in the starlight, in the dark. And he came silently again, hour after hour, looking into the room, saw him standing, unmoving, his heart filled with anger, with anxiety, with fear, and then with sorrow. And in the last hour of the night, before daybreak, he returned again, entering the room, and saw the youth standing there. He seemed tall and a stranger to him. Siddhartha, he said, why are you waiting? You know why. Will you go on standing and waiting until the di until day, noon, evening? I will stand and I will wait. You will grow tired, Siddhartha. I will grow tired. You will fall asleep, Siddhartha. I will not fall asleep. You will die, Siddhartha. I will die. And would you rather die than obey your father? Siddhartha has always obeyed his father. So you will give up your project? Siddhartha will do what his father tells him. The first light of day entered the room. The Brahmin saw that Siddhartha's knees trembled slightly, but there was no trembling in Siddhartha's face. His eyes looked far away. Then the father realized that Siddhartha could no longer remain with him at home, that he had already left him. The father touched Siddhartha's shoulder. You will go into the forest, he said. 
and become a Samana. If you find bliss in the forest, come back and teach it to me. If you find disillusionment, come back and we shall again offer sacrifices to the gods. Together. Now go, kiss your mother and tell her where you're going. For me, however, it is time to go to the river to perform the ablutions. He dropped his hand from his son's shoulder and went out. Siddhartha swayed as he tried to walk. He controlled himself, bowed to his father, and went to his mother to do as he was told, as he had told him. As he, as with benumbed legs, he slowly left the still sleeping town at daybreak. A crouching shadow emerged from the last hut and joined the pilgrim. It was Govinda. You have come, said Siddhartha, and smiled. I have come, said Govinda. All right, that's the end of chapter one. So that's just the beginning. That's the exposition, okay? I know it seems a little weird right now, but that is the exposition, okay? The rest of the story is going to be a trajectory. You're going to see the whole plot, the climax, the resolution, all that stuff. Um, so bear with me. Now, what we're going to do with each one of these chapters, we're actually going to do an ancient practice that monks used to do when they were analyzing text. So this one specifically was Christian monks that would use this technique to analyze scripture, and it's called Florilegium. It means literally a book of flowers. So what they would do is they would read through scripture and they would pick out just a single sentence and they would write it down. And they would do that over and over. And they're not connected, they're not contiguous. They would just write a sentence, write a sentence, write a sentence. We're gonna do that for each chapter. And you're gonna look at that sentence that you write down. And you're gonna, you're gonna explain this to me. Why did you pick it? What was it that made it like stick out to you? What was the shininess on it? What made it like, um, what made it draw you? Because we're going to pick one sentence from this chapter. And for some reason, you're going to pick one and you're going to try to explain why you picked it. That's the first thing. The second thing, you're going to say what it literally means to the story. Like there's something going on in the story. We know right now Siddhartha is getting ready to leave the town what was going on within the story, all right? And then the third thing, we're gonna get a little deeper. How can you take that and apply it to your own life or the larger world, all right? That's what we're gonna do for chapter one. So I think I already have one underlined, so I'll give you an example here. And I know this is getting really long. We're almost on to like 30 minutes, so. Um, my example, is when Siddhartha is talking about his father, if I can find that. And he's talking about how he is also a seeker. Hmm. Well, I can't find it at the moment, but and in the interest of ending this at around the 30 minute mark, the quote is, is my father not also a seeker? And that's where Siddhartha is realizing that his parents, as worthy as they are, as amazing as they are, they've raised him, they've done a great job, they're not perfect, and they don't know everything. And Siddhartha's realizing in that moment, I'm going to have to strike out on my own, and I'm going to have to figure th some things out for myself, because my parents can't live my life for me. Right? That's what's literally taking place in the story when he says that. It, I, it drew, t drew me in because, I don't know, it's talking about leaving home and fathers and parents and stuff. And obviously I went through that. I left my home after like after high school, I went to college and I never came back. I was just ready, man. I was ready to go out into the world. And um, I don't regret that even now, both of my parents have passed and uh, I still don't regret it because it was the right choice for me in that time. Not that I never went back to see him or anything, but I'm glad I didn't go back home and live. I was ready to get out and experience life on my own. So that's why I picked it. I can kind of connect with it on a personal level. And then we know what's literally going on in the story. Larger world, it makes me think about you guys, all right? Like I said before I started this whole thing, at some point we realize that we got to go on our own path. Even if I tell you exactly some of the things that are going to happen to you and how you should deal with them, that's not good enough. We have to make our own mistakes. We have to fall down. If I say, don't do this because it'll hurt, you're still going to try it, some of you. And 
that's coming from the kid that stuck like things in the electrical outlet. So I know a little thing about uh, trial and error. So those are the three perspectives there. Why I picked it, what's going on in the story, and what it means in the larger scheme of life. And you're going to write that down. I'm actually going to, I'm going to post a thing on Google Classroom with this. That's going to be like a chronicle for Siddhartha. But I think I'm only going to post a chapter at a time. Every day I'll post a chapter for you to do instead of posting the whole huge thing on there. Because I know if I post the entire thing on there with every one of the chapters, you'll wait to the last minute to do it. And I don't mean you or you or you, but I mean you. And you know who you are. You right there. You will put it off to the last minute. So I'm just going to post a daily assignment. Um, yeah, that's all I've got for you today. That's all of chapter one. Find a quote. And it could be literally anything in chapter one. It should be a full sentence, but um, explain why you picked it, what it means in the story in context, and then expand the context to the larger world. That's your job. That's what I want you to do. Other than that, I want you to stay healthy, stay smart, stay safe, stay clean, keep with the social distancing. Um, have a great night, great week. I'll post another assignment on Wednesday. But until then, I love you. Take care.